combustion imminent? What does that mean? Ah! It means fire, Robert. Man, it seemed like we had to wait for forever to get a sequel to The Incredibles film. But was it worth the wait? Well, let's find out. My name is Brandon Keith Avery, and this is just my opinion. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank you so much for tuning in to my opinion slash review for The Incredibles 2. I really do appreciate it. It has been a long time coming. Now, if you did not know already, what The Incredibles series is about is a family of five. And these family members, they all have superpowers. They're all superheroes. You have your husband and your wife. You have two sons and you also have a daughter. And way, way back in the day, the husband and the wife, they were superheroes like out in public. Superheroes was the big thing. It was popular. Everyone living super lives, using superpowers, just doing super things. And unfortunately, uh, heroes and superpower beings were outlawed. It was made illegal. So they had to all go underground and in hiding. And now this husband and wife, they have kids and they're just trying to live their life the best they can. Um, you know, underground, just really not living up to their full potential. Now, this film right here is being written and directed by Brad Bird. Of course, um, he did direct the first film as well. Uh, which I I have right here and I, I showed it to my mother a couple of weeks ago because she hasn't seen it and uh, she wanted to see it and I, I'll come back to that in a second but Brad Bird I'm a fan of his I'm not really a fan of the movie he did uh, Tomorrowland which came out a few years ago I was very disappointed by that but he did do the Iron Giant and he also did of course the Incredibles Ratatouille uh, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol which is the fourth Mission Impossible film I love this one this is actually uh, this is actually my favorite so the guy is a pretty good director. He said, you know, um, Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney and uh, Brad Bird made an announcement in April 2014, a little over four years ago, that this sequel was coming. And now it's finally here. And he said that he always wanted to make a sequel to this film, but he definitely did not want to do it unless he knew that it was going to be as great as the first film or even better. And that may seem like a given. Like, of course, no director will want to do that. But no, that's really not the case. Sometimes these people are out here just because they need a paycheck. It's a cash grab. And, you know, the studio is just trying to make money. Now, I found it interesting that this is the first film uh, in Pixar to use profanity out of 12 films. I don't know why they made that decision. I don't remember any B words, or F bombs or, you know, S-H-I-T's or anything like that. But when I was doing a little research, that is one of the facts that I came behind. And the whole original cast for the voicing came uh, back as well, except for the uh, the gentleman that uh, voiced Dash, the little boy with superpowers that runs lightning fast and can run across water and things like that. Well, the first film was 14 years ago, so that child grew up and his voice is deep, so of course we have to come and get somebody to replace that. But the first thing that I like about this film is literally how it picks up right where the first film leaves off. I mean, at the end of the film, you have a big wreck in a parking lot, and that little short dude comes up like, Behold, I am the Underminer. I am always beneath you, but nothing is beneath me. I hereby declare war on peace and happiness soon all will tremble before me you know and like the incredibles are putting on their mask and things like that and when i brought up my mom just a second ago when i showed this to her a few weeks ago and we was watching the very end of the movie i started quoting the underminer like that and she kind of just looked at me crazy like you really like this movie don't you and i was just like yes mom i do and she also kind of looked at me like she was worried too but hey you know I'm just having fun. Um, but again, this film picks up right where uh, the first one leaves off. And what they could have done is they could have gave us this opening scene in the perspective of the heroes uh, like we saw during the whole first film. But they did not do that. And it's just the way that they told the story, the way the lenses that they gave us, the, the way they connected to two films from one to two from a, a perception that I, I wouldn't have thought of. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I thought it expanded the world. Uh, the, I'm not not the world, but the universe of the Incredibles and just how deep underground this superhero 
um, these superhero lives in this environment goes and what people have to do behind the scenes to keep it all secret. That's just something that really stood out to me. And what stood out to me right after that, I mean, it started with an action scene and we saw, of course, we got action of the family in the first film, but even though this film picks up right where the second one leaves off, it seems like, I don't know, for some short period of time in between films that the family got together on a weekend or something like that and practiced all of their powers because just really seeing them a, a family of four or five because you have to include Jack Jack, seeing them run around the city using their powers while at the same time trying to hold a baby that is not used to his powers yet, I just thought it was brilliant. I mean, it's fun. Like, while they're fighting and Mr. Incredible is being strong and punching things and the last girl is swinging around with her elasticity and Violet is doing things with her invisibility and, you know, her able to make force fields and things like that and dash run, I was like, okay, damn, this is nice or whatever. I'm really feeling this, okay? I mean, we all want a real Fantastic Four movie by Disney Marvel, but this is going to be the first and closest thing to it. But I was just like really impressed by that, the way everything was choreographed together. Uh, Frozone came through there, played by Samuel Jackson. He is a badass. I mean, in this movie, he was my favorite character in Elastigirl. There was just something about these two characters uh, that just really stood out to me. I love the way Frozone was just about to use his powers. I mean, he has ice powers like uh, Ice uh, Iceman from the X-Men, where he can just, you know, if there's a body of water around him, he can manipulate it to create ice or grab moisture out of there and create ice. And you think that you've probably seen it all with powers like that in the first film or any other form of entertainment that you grew up on or known from the past. But I saw ice powers in a way that I've never seen before on a grand scale at the very beginning of the movie. So I'm just smiling like, yes, you know, it kind of just made me feel like I was a little kid again, Saturday morning cartoons or whatever. Me, you know, a young, grown adult male or whatever, cheesing ear to ear, you know, like I know um, I'm about to get a thousand presents on my birthday or Christmas. So, you know, that was that was great right there. I love that from Fozone. I really do love that from um, Elastigirl as well. Um, now, also what I like about this is like the real world politics that they included in the movie. And this is just another way of how the movie is not just for children, that this is for adults too. But if you've seen the first film, you possibly already know that. But there are consequences. I mean, you know, um, I would be very, very thankful if I had a superhero in my neighborhood that would just come save the day if, you know, somebody want to come and try to wreck shop or, you know, something like that. But at the same time, it's not necessary and some people in the world may not be appreciative of that because it's like okay hey i see what you're trying to do man but you are really creating more damage than the villain itself so you know can you please back up you know it kind of just reminded me of uh i mean this was in the first film which came out in 2004 which came out way before captain america civil war where they had to do the uh sokovia courts but there was kind of like a little sense of debt in this movie and just like you know damage and um, property and, and politics and government and you know they're uh, overwatch over things and just trying to keep things secret and just you know all these little things and tinkering little gizmos and gears behind the scenes that are going on and you know that's just something that uh stood out to me as well uh, now i'm bragging and boasting about how great the action in this movie and it is freaking fantastic i mean i, I was blown away and i'll get to that in a second but Besides all that in the action, I mean, this film is really just concentrating on the family. The family dynamic in this movie was uh, one of the better family relationships that I've seen in the movie off the top of my head in quite a long time. This family is not perfect. I mean, no family is, and they put that on the screen. And there's just a way, another way for me able to sympathize and empathize with the characters. I mean, you know, just because um, someone is married, of course, doesn't mean they're going to be arguments and screaming, you know, at the top of the lungs at each other and things like that. And that is in this film, um, you know, reminds me of my parents, probably reminds you of your parents too. That's just another real world element that they wanted to include in the film. So just got to give it up to Brad Bird as far as that's concerned. And not, I mean, I'm not only am I just, is it entertaining to see the family on screen interact with each other, but um, I care about them too. I care about Dash, you know, and him wanting to show his super speed. Um, I care about the stresses that Bob has to go through, Mr. Incredible, as how he's trying to be the provider of his family, you know, and he has a strong wife, too, that, you know, uh, I was about to say something crazy. That, well, that may have been misinterpreted, but, you know, he has a strong wife, too, to where, uh, you know, she knows her place, 
But at the same time, he does as well. You, you know, the, the, there wasn't much dialogue. I mean, there was dialogue, of course, between the characters. But I was just able to read between the lines to where, you know, they're like checking each other. But at the same time, they know, OK, like I, I can talk to my wife this way because it's my wife. Or I can talk to my husband this way because of my husband. But at the same time, I know not to just take it there. You know what I'm saying? You know, he just may go crazy or she just may go crazy. And, you know, that's just something, uh, you know, that just another thing that just really st stood out to me that this this that that wasn't right there, you know, at the front of the screen, but it's just kind of like the mannerisms in between them two, you know, when they're bickering at the table or in the kitchen or, you know, in the living room or something like that. I just really love the family uh, dynamic. Now, something else that is real world um, that is in this movie is uh, gender roles. You know, usually the man is uh, perceived to be the provider, the breadwinner. And especially back in the day, the wife is being left at home to care for the kids, to cook clean and things like that. And while I do agree that there are just certain roles that a man should do in the household that a woman and that a woman should do in the household, I, I don't think a mandate should be put down. But when I say it should be, it's like, you know, I don't think if a man and the women are married that the man, I mean, that the woman should be the one that's out there cutting the grass and cleaning out the gutters and repatching the wool, the the roof. Uh, I think that that's something that a man should do, um, you know, and I think most people can agree with me. And, you know, and that may leave the wife inside to, you know, do everything else or uh, not everything else, but a number of other things. But that was that was switched in this role right here. You have Bob. Um, the Mr. Incredible in this movie, in the first film right here, you know, he is so driven by the glory days of him being a superhero. When you've seen the first film, he's in the car with Frozone Samuel Jackson, listen to police scanners, you know, because he just can't uh, escape the, the itch of fighting bad guys and saving the day. And so, it, and it's eating him up on the inside when he's not able to do that. But when he finally gets an opportunity to, in the first film, he takes advantage of that. There's similar story beats to that in the in the second film, but the uh, the script is flipped to where Bob has to stay at home and Elastigirl, his wife, is the one that has to go out and save the day. And at the same time, I can see that that's like eating him up on the inside and just tearing him apart. But I just love this character even more because he was just like, hey, you know, I got to put my pride aside and put my personal interests away. You know, the perfect opportunity for us to thrive is for my wife to go out here and do that. And that, I just think that was just kind of bold not to cater for in the writing is, is what I mean. I think that was bold for Brad Bird not to cater to any stereotypes or uh, what a chauvinist male way want. Like, okay, I, I, I got to go out, you know, and the, the women got to stay at home. No, they didn't care about that at all. They had a last girl out there as one of the main protagonists in this film kicking butt, kicking ass, just doing what she has to do. And it, it was funny. It was exciting. You know, I wasn't just out there just sitting there just like, man, you know, when, why are the women doing the action? No, Elastigirl will whoop your ass, okay? She had this nice little bike that was, uh, I, I forgot what it was, I think it was called like the Elasta bike. That was nice. Just seeing her and all her power swinging around, uh, stretching and things like that. It was cool as hell. I was feeling, I mean, it seemed like she was like a Spider-Man or something like that, but because she's elastic can do just a little bit more things too. I mean, I was very impressed by that. The way they show her using her powers, going through the city, chasing after a train on a bike, all that combined or whatever. It was very innovative innovative it was very creative and you know i loved it it was eye candy for anybody that likes action and superhero powers kind of just combined together i like that but what's crazy is as great as that is seeing bob at home staying trying to uh nurture the kids violet jack jack and um and uh violet jack jack and dash that was fun too i mean the, he is you know, I don't, I don't know what I would want to do. Whether I, I want to be at home with the kids or out fighting bad aliens or whatever. I mean, they just both seem completely difficult to do. And um, I really do like that this film really showcased how difficult, I guess, uh, a housewife or somebody standing home could be. Because they just grind at home, making sure that the house is clean, making sure that dinner is cooked. You know, making sure the kids wash their they, they, uh, hair and brush their teeth and cook dinner and all that. You know, the man may be um, the foundation of the home, but the woman holds it together. And while her role may not be appreciated, it, this film did a great job of just showing how important, you know, the house role of staying at home, uh, how important that is and that it should not be taken lightly or uh, take it, taken for granted.
And now I'm gonna go to uh, yeah, page two of my notes. Now, let me see here, but I don't wanna live in the glory days. Okay, now uh, another thing, let's get to these powers, but I wanna start with Jack Jack. Everything with Jack Jack in this film was freaking fantastic. All the powers he had, I mean, they really did dedicate a lot of time to Jack Jack in this movie without it being forced or shoved down your throat. I mean, and I'm speaking of multiple scenes here. Um, there was another scene with Edna Mode in this movie as well. I probably should look up who that actor is because she is so freaking funny. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to, I can't find my cursor, so I can't look it up. But uh, she, I just, not nah, actually, I, she just deserves the credit. Um, my goodness gracious, where is the dang cursor at? I'm sorry, guys. But um, Edna Mode in the first film is the young lady. She's extremely short. She is the one that uh, made all these soups for the uh, the Incredibles family. And I just I just love her or, or whatever. She was um, she was a pleasure to see on film and to hear as well. Edna Mode, what? Brad Bird is okay. I did not know that. Brad Bird, the writer and director of this movie, is the voice for um, Edna Mode. So I'm actually glad I did look it up. So that just even makes me more impressed with Brad, Brad Bird and just how much talent he has behind the screen. But, you know, everything with Jack Jack was just freaking uh, fantastic. Like, just it, it was funny. I mean, the whole entire audience was laughing their butt off. Uh, throughout the whole movie, uh, but especially at Jack Jack, and like I said, I, I said this movie was funny. It was funny as hell. Without, like, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I laughed ten times as hard in this movie that I did on the first film. I mean, the first film was funny, but this film is even funnier. I mean, laughing out loud, like I said, for the second or third time now, uh, the whole auditorium was laughing throughout this whole thing, or just like over and over and over and over again. And uh, I was just talking about Bob just a second ago. Um, it's just something else that I do like about his character too is, you know, he is really just trying to be a better father, a better husband, just a better person. And he makes mistakes and some of them are stupid mistakes, but you know, um, I like where his heart was. His heart was in the right place. And that just goes to show again that, you know, uh, being a father, being a dad can be a very hard thing to do. Um, you know, I love my dad to death. You know, he is a textbook example of a provider uh, so if you're watching this dad, you know, you know, much respect to you, sir. Uh, but at the same time, fathers aren't perfect and they make mistakes. And there's been times where I've been mad at my dad, too. Some for valid reasons, some for stupid reasons or whatever, you know. Um, and that's just I was just able to relate to the scenes where, you know, Bob, uh, Mr. Incredible, was just trying to be the best man, the best father, the best um, the best husband that he could be while still making his mistakes. And, and he didn't have any pride. He was able to apologize when necessary without being too apologetic. You know, he was just a great character, you know, all around. Um, something else that I liked about this film is that it really did uh, shine a light on perception and how perception is everything and how it molds the minds of everybody in human existence and just how important that is. And so, um, you know, that, um, just another great thing that stood out to me. And, um, I really just love this film. There is nothing that I can complain about it except for one thing. And that is when it comes down to the villain. Now, the villain in the first film uh, was Syndrome, and I liked him a lot. I had no quarrels with him being a villain. He was just a psychotic, insecure character that took it too far. But I liked it because, um, you know, it, it sound, it, it, at the same time, it, it felt grounded, you know. But the villain in this film, Screen Slaver, um, I liked. This I like the look of Screen Slaver. I like the effects, and I like everything that he was doing with technology. Um, excuse me. It was kind of scary at the same time. Not scary like I wasn't scared in the movie, but scary in a sense to where it's like, man, you know, what if things like this actually come true in real life where people can do things like this with technology? But when it came to the reveal of who the Screen Slaver was, it was very predictable. I, as soon as they showed a certain group of characters on screen, I was like, you know what? I bet that they may have something to do with the villain in this film. And I was right. I mean, I, I saw it coming a mile away. And uh, also, when it just comes down to the villain, I see where they were trying to go with it. But the, their execution just really did not make any sense to me. Um, when I thought about it towards the end, I'm just, okay, I understand what you're trying to do, but the way you went about it just seemed completely unnecessary and redundant to where I'm just like, you had this long drawn out plan, but it's, it's like, 
the villain was basically just cleaning up their own mess, in my opinion. And, you know, if you didn't make the mess in the first place, you know, you wouldn't have to do this diabolical plan to where you're trying to uh, take over the world or put supers on the ground forever. But that's just my only complaint. The villain just didn't completely suck, but it could have been better. The motivation was there. It was just really the execution of the plan and how they went about it. Now, everyone probably wants to know, is this film as good as the first one? Is it worse? Is it the same? I will go ahead and say that this film is exactly on par with the first film. I like them both the same. Now, there are some things in the first film that I do like better in the second. Uh, I mean, there are some things that happen in the first film that I like more than the second. But there are also some things in the second film that I like. I think that I uh, did better in the first film. For example, the second film is much, much funnier than the, uh, the I'm sorry. The second film is much more funnier than the first film. But the first film had a better ending action scene than the uh, second film. Uh, the second film had a weaker villain than the first film. Um, but wait, the second, I'm sorry. The second film had a worse villain than the first film. Uh, but the second film also had better character development than the first film. So it just kind of balances out there. Um, if I had to rate The Incredibles 2, out of a 1 out of 10, I'm going to give this thing a 9.5 out of 10. Yes, a 9.5 out of 10. I love this movie. When I was walking up, people were just like, oh, man, you know, it was better than the first. But, guys, that is just my opinion for The Incredibles 2 movie. What did you think? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did I turn it? Did I turn you on? Did I turn you off? Do you agree with me or do you disagree with me? Let me know down in the comment section below. Let's get this conversation going and keep it flowing. If you like this video, go ahead and give me the thumbs up. And if you don't, that's fine. But you can still subscribe to my channel. You can also um, look me up on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All that good stuff. It's right there at the bottom of the screen, but I made it very easy by providing a link to all that good stuff down in the description box below. But guys, before you go, don't forget that uh, my name is Brandon Keith Avery. And that's just my opinion. Peace.